Pet. Good morning, congregation. Would you stand with us, please? Let us worship the Lord of Lords. How did it sound out there? Did it? Because it didn't sound loud enough to me. It didn't sound loud enough to you? It, it sounded a little like, we were just kind of whispering, I'm a friend of God. I'm a friend of God. You know, I'm a friend of God. Pat, do me a favor and just turn up the, like, yeah, we want to feel the presence of the Lord in this place. And that doesn't mean that we need it louder. 
doesn't mean we need it quieter. What it means is we need the right heart. Mm. Father, in this place today, I pray for the right heart. I pray that you would move mightily within each of us. As we yield ourselves to you, you would minister to us, to the very depths of our soul. Father, some come in this very morning, they're rejoicing, they're excited. Meet them where they are, accept their praise. Others come crawling in, barely able to get here. Father, I pray that you meet them right where they are. Meet their every need. Might you lead them spiritually. Might they sense your filling of the Holy Spirit. Father, this place, set aside for your good works. Continue your good works in the name of your Son, we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Now, I sound like really loud. You may be seated in his presence. This morning, uh, we got in the doghouse, we got... I haven't, don't see her sneaking in. Sharon McAlilly? Sharon McAlilly? I don't see her. She's been here. She must have found out she was in the doghouse. <laughs> she's just the type that if you tell her she's in the dog, she's not coming. Well, let's pray for Sharon. If you don't know Sharon, she's, uh, you should know her. She's quite a prayer warrior, and she's uh, uh, filled full of the Holy Spirit of God, and she's always coaxing the pastor pastor preach on the spirit preach on the spirit father we need more of the spirit here pastor and so uh if you know sharon she'll she'll love on you and she'll pray for you so let's just uphold our dear sister before the lord father in heaven we just continue in our moment of prayer father and praying for our dear sister and Father, we would pray that you might continue to revive her, uphold her. Father, whatever anxiousness she might have concerning her finances, her relationships, Father, with her children, Father, I pray that you would meet her right where she's at, Father, and fill her to overflowing, that she might recognize that you are working within her life. And Father, as she comes before you, Father, I pray that you would, you would honor her, bless her abundantly, keep her physically strong. Father, keep her spiritually intact and in seeking your face. We come before you and uphold our dear sister in the name of your son. Amen. Hey, check, out. check this out. <laughs>
Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, I never want to take for granted the freedom that we can gather in this place. Open your word. Father, I never want to take for granted that I have the freedom to speak. And Father, this Memorial Weekend, I pray, I pray on behalf of those that have given all and sacrificed all. I pray that you would honor their memory, that you would bless our country. Father, have your way among us. We desire to know you more, to live for you, to honor you, to serve you. Father, hear our hearts cry as we come before you, pledging our honor and our courage to sustain a way of life. In the precious name of Jesus. Like me. Stand with us. Just continue to worship our God. Can we get her up a little more? Worthy of every. 
every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you.
Glory to your name. Thank you. Barbara, say a prayer for us, would you? Yeah. Father, we just thank you so much, Lord, for this weekend and what it means to us as Americans, Lord. And we th are so grateful, Lord, for those that, like you, have sacrificed their life for mm -hmm. our freedom. Thank you, Lord God, for giving us Jesus, that we might have freedom to worship you forever by placing our faith and our trust in the only way, the only truth, the only life that is our Savior, Jesus. Mm -hmm. We just thank you so much, Lord God. We thank you for your presence being here. And we ask you to fill us, Lord, and to lead us. Teach us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm not supposed to say this, but it's so good to see so many new faces in church. We have a special day today, and I just can't go without saying that. So congratulations. So nice to see everybody. And some unexpected faces, some returners, now that COVID is kind of coming at bay. So it's good to see a lot of you. Then you, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard me say in the presence of so many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one serving as a soldier, soldier gets entangled in civil affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who completes, competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by comp competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all things. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. There is a trustworthy saying, if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of the truth. Avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. 
Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with his inscription. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord Jesus Christ must turn away from wickedness. In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and of sil silver, but also of wood and clay. There are some for purposes, special purposes, and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the later will be instruments for that special purpose, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who are called on the Lord of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolishness and stupid arguments, because you know they only produce, produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope of God that will grant them repentance leading to them the knowledge of truth and that they will come to their senses and escape from all the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. May the Lord, Lord bless his reading. Amen. Yeah, girl. God bless you. Wendy Williams, love you, girl. Thank you so much. I guess I can put this over here. So it indeed is a special day today, isn't it? So I'm hoping that uh, several of you will hang around, or all of you will hang around today, even after services. So uh, there's a lot of people probably here going, oh, I hope he gets through his message fast. All I can say is, no. <laughs> no, not going to happen today. There's a lot of stuff in that passage, isn't there? My goodness gracious, I could preach for a month of Sundays just on that passage alone. It was several years ago, kind of had an encounter with the Lord, and he gave me some, In I'm sure, I'm sure I must have shared this before, and I'm, I'll probably repeat myself again, but it's worth noting. He gave me some real good insight and perspective on this church. And at the time, I was kind of struggling a little bit with uh, the hard messages that I had just kind of been presenting to the congregation, and they were, they were challenging messages. They were not fluff and feel good, and they seemed to be just one after another, after another, after another. And it seemed like I was thrashing the congregation, and, and it just felt like, am I in a place where I'm just bringing this word of God that, that just seems so challenging and can be really kind of harsh? They were, they were messages that kind of made you think about whether you wanted to be a Christian or not. They weren't the kind of messages that kind of draw people, you know, with, with love and the tender promises of prosperity and, and things of that nature. And so it's really struggling before the Lord, so, you know, can't you give me some of those, you know, fluff and puff messages that I can, you know, when are we going to get to some passages in Scripture where I'm not? And the Lord was very clear. This is not how I use this congregation. And let me share with you, when the Lord reveals something to you like that, that it's solid and it's truth. And it usually required, it, I know it did, it usually, in this particular case, it absolutely required my repentance. It required my adjustments and my understanding of how God was at work within me and within the congregation. So, first, I was glad that he was using this place, right? The words came pretty clear. This is not how I use this congregation. This is not how I use this New Life Alliance church. This is not how I use this place. So, first and foremost, hallelujah, can I get an amen? God is using this place, right? Amen. Touching hearts. He's ele elevating our thoughts and restructuring us, and he's directing your pastor. Hallelujah. 
Thank you, Lord, for even considering that I might approach you. And what the Lord shared with me was that this is not a fluff and puff church. We're not blowing smoke. This is not a show for your entertainment. God is involved in this church for people that want to go deeper in their spiritual walk, deeper in their faith, deeper in their ministry efforts, deeper in their reliance upon him. So the question beckons for certain, is there anyone like that in here today? You want to go deeper with God. This is one of those passages that kind of lends itself to, you know, all the fluffy stuff, real basic kind of stuff. It also lends itself to some real hard things that are required in the Christian walk, required in the Christian walk. Believe me, I want to preach the fluff and puff sermons, but I would not be serving the Lord as he asks me to in doing so. Just so you're aware that if you're here today, this morning, or if you're tuning in at home, the Lord wants you to know the reality of walking the Christian life, the reality of walking a spiritual life. He desires that you would go deeper in your walk. It's not always an easy road. In fact, many times it's a narrow road, and your companions may at times be very few. You'll have to make tough decisions. It will definitely require sacrifices, and it will require commitment. Now, some things we already know about this letter, some things we already know about what Paul's been writing back to Timothy. Timothy is in Ephesus because the church there is enduring a lot of hardship, false teachers, bad leadership. Culture has infiltrated into the church, and the church looks way too much like Ephesus, the city that is all around it. And Paul sends Timothy, go straighten things out over there, will you? And things did not go well. They did not go well for Timothy. Or Paul, who comes back for a visit. Paul basically, once he's there in Ephesus, has to flee for his life. And he ends up back in prison in Rome. And that's where this letter originates from as he writes back to Timothy to encourage him to continue to live a godly lifestyle, preaching the word and preparing for the coming apostasy, for the coming of those that are going to fall away from the following of God and fall away from God's idea of the church. We know the political climate has changed. It is not just the Jewish people that are debating and oppressing Christianity. In the early stages of Christianity, it was the Jews mostly that were debating and arguing, and the oppression and persecution came from the Jews towards the Christians. Now, it's the Roman government that has now begun persecuting the Christians under the new Caesar that has been established, Nero. And he writes... You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Here's your first one for those that like to take notes. Succession is a direction. Succession is a direction. Paul thinks of Timothy really as a son. It was through Paul's ministry that Timothy came to listen to the word, came to serve the Lord. Timothy is the first of the second generation Christians. Timothy is the first of the second generation Christians, from Lois' grandma and Eunice, his mother. Paul invites him into ministry to serve. And every believer is a child of God by faith. Every believer is a child of God by faith. We even call each other brother and sister. Not by natural descent, but by a spiritual rebirth. We've been born and adopted into an heir of the great king. We are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, and we are united 
We are united into a wonderful family full of diversity, different languages, races, cultures, personalities, born of faith in Christ. And we have nothing of our own merit. We are saved by the amazing grace that Paul's encouraging Timothy with and that Barbara sang so wonderfully about. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And this is also where we must stand. When things aren't quite like the way you want them to be, rely on his grace. When things don't flow the way that you had anticipated or thought that they should, rely on his grace. When life gives you more problems than solutions, you have to rely on his grace. When you have more debts than income, you're going to have to rely on his grace. We too must stand in the grace that is in Jesus. And there will be days that's all you've got to rely on. There will be times when it feels as, if, feels as if your world will be coming to an end or crashing all around you. All that you've worked for could be lost. All that you've strived for, gone. All that you've built up, destroyed, rotten over time. When you are discouraged, trust in the name of Jesus. Stand in his grace. Walk in that grace. The saving grace of Jesus Christ. Things don't look so encouraging for Timothy, they certainly aren't encouraging for Paul, sitting in a prison cell, cell under a Caesar who hates Christians. And he says, continue. Continue to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And all these things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will, who will also be qualified to teach others. Here's your next one. As believers, we have been entrusted with this great grace. As believers, we've been entrusted with this knowledge, with this truth, with this understanding. We've been entrusted with this insight, with this privilege, and our responsibility. And we are supposed to take our spiritual insight and put it under a bowl. We're supposed to take all our spiritual insight and sweep it under the rug. We're supposed to take all the enlightenment and the spiritual encouragement that we receive from God and stick it in the corner so that no one might notice. You have been given. You have been entrusted with truth and understanding and insight. Why? To give it away. To give it away. To give it away. Christianity is not just about you. Your salvation is not just about you. I know you think the world revolves around you, but it does not. And your salvation, while pleasing and praiseworthy, is doesn't end there. It's just the beginning. Not only about what God wants to do in you, but what God wants to do through you. And isn't that exactly what Paul was doing with Timmy? It's Timothy, it's discipleship. Passing it on. Giving himself away. Training the next generation. He even calls him his son. The old preacher turning to the young preacher and encouraging him, stay the course, rely on the grace of God. Don't turn away. Don't you quit. You keep going forward. I think we have a duty to invest what God has given to us in our lives into others. Do you agree with that? That's a mature Christian attitude. That doesn't make Christianity self-serving you. It makes your Christianity much bigger and God-based and scripture-based in discipleship, reaching the lost, edifying the saint. And isn't that what a parent does? Disciple and teach the next generation? Isn't that what a church does? Disciple and reach the next generation? Make disciples 
mature believers and multiply ministries. That's what we do over and over and over again. We make disciples, we mature believers, and we multiply ministries. Succession is part of the direction of the church, pouring our lives into the lives of others. Now listen. Gosh. This should expand your mind a little bit. I hope that it does. It might get you out of the box of putting God in the box. It might get you to think a little bit differently. Listen, succession is part of the direction of the church, pouring our lives into the lives of others. Listen, whether they come to the church or not. Can I get you to be kingdom-minded? Christ-oriented? Not denominationally devoted, but to Jesus. We are stewards of what has been entrusted to us. And it's not just stewardship of a building and some pews and chairs and air conditioners. It's the stewardship of the knowledge of Christ that has been imparted to you. This great mystery, this great wealth of knowledge, this wisdom, if you ask for it, been imparted to you. We have a responsibility, a privilege. We've been entrusted to be a good steward of the word of God, to speak it properly and know what we're talking about and why we believe what we believe. A good steward of the spiritual awareness that is taking place in other people's lives even when they don't see it. You've been given insight and great discernment and to be able to communicate clearly to a very dark, cursed, lost world. We sing hallelujah, I'm found. Well, how do you deal with the lost? How many of us have tossed our pearls before the swine? What? Waste your energy and waste your time. Jesus said, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to the pigs. If you do, they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you apart. Listen to what the next verse is. That's out of Matthew 7, I believe. Next verse Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. You trying to jam scripture and your insight and your knowledge down somebody's throat is not pleasant for them, and it's pointless for you. They will fight you, and they will bite you. Plant a seed and move on. People have to come to a place where they desire God. God draws them in, not you. God draws them in. The Holy Spirit is at work in people. He's drawing people unto himself, searching them out. People need to be open to receiving what God would have for them. Knocking on the door. What do you got for me, God? Many people do not even know what's missing in their lives. They don't know. There's a spiritual void that they try to fill up with drugs and sex and alcohol and you name it. And there's a big vacant void that if you're walking full of the Holy Spirit, you know how to fill that void. You know what brings you peace. You know who gives you the wisdom and the knowledge and the discernment and the peace to walk amongst all the others. You have the power and the responsibility to lead them and guide them. I've learned over the years when to speak and when to remain silent for my own health. I'm walking in the power of the Most High God It is not me who lives, but Christ within me. I don't waste my breath or my time on useless debates, 
pointless arguments only intended to bring division and to drive me into anger and frustration, to steal my peace, to get me to do something that's ungodly and unchristian, to tear me down or to degrade the church. I will be a good steward of my time. I will be a good steward of my talent. I will be a good steward of my treasure. The scriptures are clear. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And if you find yourself quarreling a lot, you might be the problem. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome but must be kind to everyone, able to teach and not resentful. And you know what that takes? That takes a mature Christian. You know what that takes? That takes strength. That takes strength of character. That takes determination. That takes good discernment. That takes wisdom. And Paul goes into some very familiar workers or activities or professions that we're very familiar with to drive the point home. He discusses the soldier the athlete, and the farmer. I just call it strength training. There's your next one, strength training. We gathered in church today for some strength training to dig deeper, to get stronger, to become more spiritually fit. I hope you didn't show up for a bunch of fluff and nutter, right? But that you're interested in what God's doing within your heart. Then when you're sitting in the pew, you don't go, wow, that was a really great message. It should have been for someone. I wish they were here today. It's for you. You come seeking God so that your life might be improved, that you might become more mature, that you might gain more in the wisdom. We have gathered in church today for some strength training. The first one he deals with is a soldier near and dear to my heart. This is not a playground, folks. This is a battlefield. Not a playground. It's a battlefield. And a soldier has to be focused. Because a soldier will endure hardship. Are you a soldier of the cross? Are you in the army of God? You will endure hardship. You will find it. And there it is, verse 3. Paul's writing to Timothy. Join with me in my suffering like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Are you kidding me? Sungagapathio. That's last week's message. Join me in my suffering. Join me in my... Are you saying it again? Why do you keep saying this, Paul? Why do you keep saying this, writing this? Soldiers often endure hardship in their service for their country. Separation from family, danger, and death, and we're celebrating Memorial Day for those that have died for the cause. They have died at the hands of those that have an oppression to the cause. I can promise you this, soldier, the enemy fires back. The enemy fires back. Should Christians be any less willing to endure hardship for the cause of Christ than a soldier for the cause of his country? Hardship, sacrifice. Oh, these are not words for the fluff and puff crowd. Most people do not want to be inconvenienced with developing their faith. They don't want to be inconvenienced with going deeper. They don't want to be inconvenienced with getting stronger in their faith. Did you think that this life was supposed to be a pleasure cruise? That Christianity would be a bed of roses and a skip through the tulips. But you found out that you're in a war zone. You found out that you're on the front lines. You found out you were in a battlefield, that you were in training camp. I don't care what some may say, Jesus Christ is the only way. I don't care what some may do, I'm going to stand right here with you. Here we go, all right, out of sight, dynamite. Soldier, soldier, can't you see my whole life God's infantry? Soldier, soldier, don't you know we gonna march on the streets of gold? Here we go, all right, out of sight, dynamite. 
Every day and every hour, I'm going to walk in the Spirit's power. Every day and every night, I proclaim the risen Christ. All the way. Listen, no soldier serving as a soldier gets entangled with civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. A soldier's going to need to be focused, committed to the cause. There's no flip-flopping in uncertainty. Believers must concentrate on the task that is in hand. Believers have to live a life of purpose, on purpose. Good soldiers will not get distracted by this world. They carry out their orders. They are focused and they are devoted. They are devoted to pleasing their commanding officer. And they are devoted to serve. They are devoted to service. They call it the service. Well, listen, God's army, welcome to church service. You're prepared to serve. You're trained to serve. Honored to serve, authorized by the power of the Holy Spirit of God to serve. Here's your next slide. God calls and equips his followers to service, all his followers into service. Failing to serve is a dereliction of duty. It's willful misconduct. It's a neglect of your obligation. Christian service is not optional. Paul describes an athlete. An athlete plays by the rules set forth in the game. You can't kick the basketball down the court. That's a different game, different rules. The athlete must compete to the regulations that have been assigned to the game, to the match. This requires obedience, self-discipline, proper knowledge of the game. I just watched Phil Mickelson last weekend, a pro golfer, win the PGA Championship. At the age of 50 years old, the oldest man to ever win a major golf championship. Asked, Phil, how is it that you were able to beat men half your age? I worked harder. I worked harder at physically being able to practice longer and endure. I worked harder at staying mentally focused throughout the round. I didn't get distracted. I stayed focused. I worked harder. I thought about what what, what have I worked hard at? I thought about my ordination. <laughs> that was pretty hard. That was pretty difficult. It took years. But I just kept studying. I just kept swimming. I just kept writing. I thought about earning a PhD. It took years to earn a PhD. You gotta be focused, committed, and just keep showing up and just keep writing and just keep researching and just keep reading. Relentless in my pursuit. And then people would say, Man, Pastor, you're so lucky. Uh huh. Listen, you just keep swimming. You just keep showing up, good things happen. You just keep showing up to prayer means you keep showing up to Bible study and you watch what God does. You watch how lucky you get. You keep playing by the rules, God honors you. You hold on to virtue and integrity and honesty and you watch how God honors you. You keep showing and giving out grace and mercy. You outwork everyone else in giving love, giving trust. You outwork half the people just by showing up. And you watch what God will do. How lucky you get. You are being prepared for a victor's crown. You are being prepared for a victor's crown that never tarnishes, never fades, never rusts. We we strive for an eternal crown built to wear in our mansions of glory. You see that? You work as if everything depends on you, and you pray as if everything depends on God. And what a great picture of discipleship for Timothy. Not a flash in the pan, not a get-rich-quick scheme. Focused, steady, progressive, moving. Reflect on what I'm saying, he writes, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. If you don't want the insight, don't reflect. 
If you want the insight into all of this, reflect. I love that verse. Consider, think upon, contemplate, meditate upon these things, and the Lord will give you insight into how you might better serve. How do you apply all this? What is God speaking to you? Here's your next slide. Think about what you're thinking about, even right now. Some of you, I just woke up. I'm sorry, but think about your napping. You don't care. Okay, reflect on that for a while. Why you don't? Some are motivated to serve. They can't. Yeah, Pastor, you got me fired up. What? Yeah, where, what, when, how, how do I do this? Where do I, how do I join the praise team? When can I get to the Bible study? Where do I hide? Reflect on what God's saying to you and speaking to you. What, what is he saying? What is, what is he motivating you toward? Some are just agitated because I've already preached for 30 minutes. And God's challenging them, and they don't want to. They don't want to be agitated. They don't want to be challenged. What's God saying to you right now? Think about what you're thinking about. Here you are in a sanctified, holy place, in the presence of an almighty God. What occupies your mind? Who occupies your mind? You want to go deeper? Reflect on your purpose. Think about what you're thinking about. Take captive what God is speaking into your soul and how you're reacting and responding. Paul continues, God's solid foundation God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription, the Lord knows who are his. I guess that the implication, he also knows who isn't. Okay? The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone confessing the name of Jesus, the Lord, must turn away from wickedness. Then he continues in verse 20, on a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. And some are for special purposes and some are for common use. Now this is where it takes a turn. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter, from the wood and the clay, will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good works. Here's your next one, or maybe your last one. Sealed for significance. You've been sealed for significance. This is where things can go deeper. This is where you can go deeper to be useful of God. Paul's reminding Timothy that God's foundation is solid. His word will not perish. The spirit will go forth. God knows his own, and some will be useful and prepared for those good works. There are many vessels in the house. There are many in the temple. There are many in this church today. Here today, many would make a profession of their faith, yet they have never turned away from their wickedness. Many in the church in Ephesus that only desire to stir up controversies, desire to point out all the faults in others, create divisions for self-providing purposes. I just call that the house of commons. It's the house of commons. What does that mean? They have a lot in common with this world. You belong to the house of commons. They have a lot in common with sin. They have a lot in common with wickedness. They have a lot in common with immorality, a lot in common with evil desires. And oftentimes they make those professions of faith and then just stir up the body as much as they possibly can, involving themselves in all those senseless quarrels and debates and hoping that you'll join in with them. And I'm not sure, but your immaturity might be showing there comes a time in every spiritual believer's life that you're going to have to make a choice. You're going to have to make a choice. And listen, not God's choice, your choice. You choose. 
You choose God's way or your way. You choose his way of thinking, his way of dealing with certain circumstances and situations, or you deal with yours. You choose. You can choose to give a tithe or you don't. You can choose to show up at a Bible study or you don't. You can choose to make an effort or you don't. You can allow the Lord to interrupt your plans or you don't. You can choose to get involved with the church in service or you don't. You can choose drugs or you don't. You can choose sexual promiscuity or you don't. You can choose to knock off all the muck and the mire and the sticks that have been placed upon you or you don't. You choose. You choose. You own the responsibility. You decide. You be dedicated or not. You be disciplined or not. You be diligent in your pursuit of God or not. You walk in the ways of the Holy Spirit of God or not. You deal with the world as God would deal with the world or you don't. At some point, the progressive sanctification starts to take shape in your life or not. You start to move out of this clay-packed pile of sticks that are of common use. You start to move into this bright and shiny silver and gold vessel of special significance for God. God has sealed you for significance. Anybody got special china that they put in a special place, you know? Your salvation is not the end, it's the beginning. Here's your, I think your last slide. Salvation leads to sanctification. Your salvation leads to sanctification. There's an outward consecration, there's an inward sanctification. I can preach at you all day long. I can preach at you for hours on end, but until you receive it, until you believe it, it's just on the surface. I can anoint you. But until it penetrates deep into your heart, it's just surface. I can baptize you, but until the living water rushes into your soul, it's only symbolism. You must come to a sanctified place of knowing who you are and what you're good for. So what are you good for? Do you know who you are in Christ? I know who I am. And I know who you are. Because I know the Holy Spirit of God, where he dwells and where he lives, and who he fills. You know who you are? You're an elite warrior set apart for special service. That's who you are. You are given authority to overcome You are given authority to be more than conquerors. You are protected and complete in him. You are victorious and set upon a rock, a sure, firm foundation. You need not fear. You are free from condemnation. You are a soldier of the light. You are a warrior for righteousness. You are a royal priesthood sealed for significance in God's holy army. So... Go, live your life on purpose for a purpose. Go make disciples, exercise your faith, walk in the knowledge of who you are and whose you are. Let me pray for you. Father, in this place and in this moment, I pray that you would reveal yourself to each and every one. Father, I would pray that your word would soak deep within us and into our souls. And Father, may it challenge us, may it inspire us, may may it change us, may it transform us into that which you desire us to be. I continue to uphold my dear sister Sharon McAlilly, and I see her right here. Put her in the doghouse, I'm going to dog her right now, Father. Just a warrior for Christ, a prayer warrior for you. Father, just setting examples and leading. Father, I pray that you would continue to work in her life. And Father, might you bind us together as brothers and sisters in unity to bring you honor, praise, and glory that you so richly deserve. In the name of your son we pray, amen.
Hey, stand with me, please. I'll give you a benediction. And we will have uh, around noon, five afternoon, quarter after, we're going to have a wedding. Give you a, those that want to exit can exit. Those that want to hang around, take a potty break and come back in. And, and we'll start as soon as the bride says, let's go, let's do this. Because if you've ever done weddings before, you know the bride's in charge. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Go serve your God. God bless you. See you in a few minutes.